All right, so for our next session, um, we have Reach Them, Teach Them, having a lifelong learning series in your library. Um, Meg, oh, I didn't know, Wemp? Is that how you pronounce Wimpy. it? Wimpy. Ah, darn. Wimpy. It's a uh, funny last terrible. name. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and she is um, from just next door to us in Colorado um, and is going to tell us about um, lifelong learning programming that they have done um, and how you can do that with um, helping, you know, we talked earlier about continuing education for staff. This is continuing education for your actual um, patrons. So um, I'll go ahead and um, tell us all about that, Meg. Okay, well good afternoon everybody. As she said, my name is Meg Wimpy. Up here I do have my email address, which I have also put at the end of this slideshow, but feel free to jot it down. Um, if and I'll say more about that later on. Um, I am both the assistant director here as well as the adult services librarian, which means I kind of wear a few different hats and do lots of different things. Um, let's see. Um, I would like to thank you, of course, for, for um, coming to this session and staying through kind of all these different sessions. Just as a little heads up, if you aren't sure where Pagosa Springs, Colorado is, it's in Archuleta County, um, which is in southwestern Colorado. Uh, the county itself is 1,800 square miles, so it's a fairly large county. We have about 12,000 people in this county. We are about an hour east of Durango, so we're pretty far from Denver. Lots of times people say, oh, and think we're so close to Denver, but really Denver is about five and a half hours away. We do serve the entire county, and with us being pretty close to the New Mexico border. We're about 30 or 35 miles from the New Mexico border. We actually have a fair amount of people who come from Dulce, New Mexico and other places in New Mexico um, to come to our library, just as a heads up if you're kind of wondering a little bit more about our library. So again, today we'll be talking about a lifelong learning lecture series. Let me tell you kind of a, or give you a quick picture of the what the lifelong learning lecture series looks like at Ruby Sisson Library. It happens twice a year. We hold it in the spring and in the fall. It can, it is on it's for six weeks, and we have it on Thursday evenings. The talks are approximately 50 minutes to an hour, with about 30 minutes or so left for questions or comments from the people that have attended. Um, we'll be talking about how you can do a lifelong learning lecture series at your library, so let's go ahead and begin. So why lifelong learning? Of course, as, as Krista mentioned, you know, we talk about continued education for staff and, and, for, and for patrons, and I won't read this quote to you, but as you can see, ever learning understanding has been happening for a long time. People have understood going back 150 years, as seen here, and likely much longer. You're here at this webinar to learn more, maybe for yourself or maybe for your library, but hopefully you will definitely learn more. And learn more in this session to help you, to help your patrons with their ever learning. And in fact, I'm guessing that one of your library's values, or perhaps part of its mission statement, includes learning or informing other people. So how can this process happen? By doing a lifelong learning lecture series at your library, of course. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to take a lot of your staff time or a lot of effort. So let's talk about how that can happen. The biggest thing, of course, is finding speakers. I hope to show you and demonstrate that it isn't as hard as you might think originally or as daunting a task as it might seem. When I first was hired here at Ruby Sisson Library and we talked about a lifelong learning lecture series, I thought, well, who in the world? I just moved to this town. I don't know anyone. How can I find speakers? And perhaps you're in the same boat or a similar boat that you're just not really sure who you would possibly call on. So you might consider thinking about taking a walk down Main Street. What businesses are there? So think about the possibilities. Is there a credit union who could talk about financial planning for retirement? It's helpful to also think about something that they may know about that might be a little less direct than what the store is. For example, maybe there's a yoga studio and they could present on the benefits of yoga. Or maybe the same yoga studio, it's a personal business that she started and maybe that or and another company could perhaps be talking about self-starting a business. So again, kind of thinking a little bit outside the box there. Staff is another place to pull speakers. All of us have things that we know, and that includes your coworkers. So talk to your staff, or more importantly, listen when they talk about what they did on the weekends or a meeting that they attended. Maybe they love photography. 
Maybe they were in a contest. Maybe, well, who knows? You may have someone willing to share. We definitely have talented staff at my library, Ruby Sisson. From quilters to travelers to Halloween lovers to authors of books, we have a range of interests. The key thing is to see what they might be willing to talk about for 45 minutes to an hour. For one presentation, we had a staff member present on her travels to Africa. She loves both traveling and photography. The biggest challenge for her was to narrow down her pictures for the talk. I think she, saw, she had over 5,000 pictures that she had taken on this African safari, so she had lots of things to pull from. She told stories about her safari and people loved it. She was nervous about presenting at first until I told her that showing pictures and telling stories of her adventures were plenty. Because she's also a birder, she was able to name, which she of course double checked before presenting to make sure that she had the right name, the wide variety of birds and other wildlife that they encountered. We often in fact have great turnouts for these armchair tourist talks. People get to see, experience, and learn about other cultures and places without having to renew their passport, get additional immunizations, or convert currency. Patrons, they know a lot too, and often they like to share. Maybe they like to share about their hobby or their business. I did want to talk for a little bit about business and different guidelines that our library has, and perhaps your library does too. So let's go back to the yoga example that I used earlier. We have somewhat strict, well, we have guidelines, I guess I should call them. If, let's say there is a woman who has a yoga studio and she's going to come and present on the benefits of yoga, again, to use that same example from, from earlier, she's certainly more than welcome to say where she works or what the name of her company is and of course in all the public on um, all the uh, publications that we put out we would mention where she's from and what her company is called partly because it does promote her company but in addition it also shows that she has authority to be teaching or talking um, what we don't want is someone to come and during this hour-long talk to say, well, if you come into my yoga studio and, and kind of to say that over and over and be kind of very aggressive or pushy about it. So generally, we just, um, the people that that might be an issue with, we just kind of have a discussion and talk about, again, they're more than welcome to bring, you know, their contact cards that people can take with them. We, of course, when we introduce the speaker, and again, as I said earlier with the publications, we will certainly say the name of their company. It's not that we're trying to hide that, but we don't want it to become, well, a big commercial, if that makes sense to you. Again, we consider that to be a win-win scenario. And um, let's see. All right. You might also have local government agencies that are nearby you. A lot of places, perhaps where you are, hopefully, um, have a forest service, or maybe you have a nearby national monument. Maybe there's a museum, from a quilting museum to a veterans museum to an art museum. Really, again, we're just kind of looking at who's there and who's ready to share. Maybe your hospital has a wellness center that's connected to it. We here at Ruby Sisson have been fortunate to have a range of talks, and sometimes they're included with our lifelong learning lecture series, from our um, local wellness center that's connected to the medical center. Again, sometimes they have standalone workshops, but oftentimes we've integrated the talks into the lifelong learning series. For us, and let me say this because I don't think that I said it earlier, our lifelong learning lecture series covers a wide variety of topics. Again, as I mentioned, it's six talks on Thursday evenings. There is not a central theme. Again, if there were to be a theme, it's just kind of continued learning or lifelong learning. So that kind of opens it up to a wide variety of different talks and presentations. Sometimes agencies have designated outreach people for you to talk with and other times not. But even if they don't have an outreach person, they may still have a person that's willing to share. Again, sometimes, and, and I know that we're a lot of us are kind of in small places, you know, there is it's a small group of people that work for any organization or business or whatever so again maybe they don't have like an outreach department like you might have if you were in a large city. Another place to potentially get speakers from, think about if there are local colleges, universities, vocational schools that you can pull from. 
different experts who don't mind doing some pro bono work at your library, or in our case, I often use the local Fort Lewis College to get ideas. Fort Lewis College is in Durango, which as I said earlier, is about an hour west of us. They have a lifelong learning lecture series, and I often glance at their schedule of previous sessions and think about if any of the presenters would work here at this library. What I will say is that oftentimes I look at their schedule of speakers and think, well, that might be a little more academic than what our people here would like. But there are certainly people that I have pulled. In fact, there's someone that will be speaking in this spring's lifelong learning lecture series who gave the talk in the uh, Fort Lewis College's lifelong learning lecture series back in January. Their lifelong learning lecture series runs longer and, and that type of thing, but that doesn't matter because, again, I can get ideas for different things that might work here in Pagosa. Let's talk a little bit about money. For us here, we base it on whether or not people are having to drive. Um, we give them a small stipend that they can use for gas or lodging, which isn't really necessary. Oftentimes, if people are coming from anywhere, they might be coming from Drango. So lodging isn't usually required because the, the lifelong learning lectures start at 5.30. We are done by 7, so they could be very easily drive back to Durango. Again, it's an hour to maybe an hour and 15 minutes, but again, we give them a, sm a small stipend. Perhaps they just want to use it for a meal. Um, so again, we, we pay them $100 if they're coming from Durango, which I think I might actually consider cutting down because it is only 60 to 75 minutes away depending on where in Durango they're coming from. You can really make that call. One speaker that we had come from Ignacio from a Wildlife Refuge. Um, Ignacio is about halfway between Pagosa and Durango, so we gave her $50. And it, it certainly isn't something that they necessarily expect. And keeping that in mind, you can certainly lower your cost. And if you're thinking that you'd be better off not to spend actual money on having someone come, there are, of course, ways to do that. The first way that comes to mind, of course, is not to have people come from a distance that they may wish or ask about a gas stipend. And in fact, generally, with the lifelong learning and lecture series, of the six in each series, I might have one or maybe two people that are coming from somewhere else. So again, the people are local that I'm pulling from, and I'm not spending any money on that. You may also consider seeing if there are local businesses in your location that might donate things that you can give to the speakers. One thing that immediately comes to mind is a gift certificate for a meal, especially if the talk is done before or after a meal time. Depending on where you live, maybe there's something else that you can offer. I am fortunate that Pagosa Springs, we have, well, as the name implies, we have hot springs, so we have three different locations for um, going and taking a soak in hot springs, so maybe I could ask one of those or ask those places to see if they would donate a soak in the hot springs. I also, my little town has a few different breweries, so maybe it's something that you might have something like that that you could ask if they might donate a drink and an appetizer. Again, oftentimes speakers and presenters are happy to be sharing their information, so these are almost just more kind of like little boosts and just, you know, another way to say thank you essentially. Perhaps you have a local bookstore that will donate a gift certificate. One thing to really keep in mind, and I'll probably say it multiple times during this presentation, is to remember that this series is your series. So you can personalize it to suit. And we are going to do some brainstorming later where you can kind of think about what might work for you. But again, this is your series. So when I say different things, just keep in mind there are no rules. So try to think outside the norm, particularly if you're trying to make the series cost you nothing other than publicity. And I will talk about publicizing later. It is very important when you're looking and, and brainstorming on these speakers and their particular presentation topic to think about what might work in your community. Hopefully you have some sort of feel for who your people are or the people that you might want to get in. Relative to our population here in Archuleta County, we have a very large proportion of older people. It's why we have a hefty and well-used large print collection. 
um, the talks do well. Oftentimes we have a lot of people that are older and they're retired, um, so they can then they're just happy to learn. We certainly also have a, a wide variety of people that don't live here full time. Maybe they just come in the summer. Um, because we have a pretty mild summer compared to other states. Um, or maybe they're just here in the winter to go skiing. But again, think about your demographics. And they're quite possibly different. Maybe you have people that are older. Maybe you have different cultural backgrounds. Are there a lot of married people with children or young business people? Again, think about who is in your area. The Lifelong Learning Lecture Series is a great opportunity to get people into the library that may not have been in before. And I certainly find that's true with most Lifelong Learning Lecture Series that somebody will say that they had never been in the library before, but they saw that this talk was happening and now you've got this new person coming into the library. We also certainly have lots of people that are very dedicated to the Lifelong Learning Lecture Series and they come and they, I, they're common faces that I am happy to see. So when you're looking at your community, don't just look at who comes into your library, of course. Look at who you see around town when you're grocery shopping or taking a walk. Because again, lifelong learning, you don't just want to get the people that already come into the library. I know that it's certainly always one of our goals to kind of think about how to get more of these 12,000 people in the county into our library. The demographics of your community might also help you determine when you might want to hold the series, daytime or nighttime, weekday or weekend. We all work in different libraries with different situations. Perhaps where you're located has other potential speakers. So what I'd like to do right now is kind of take some of that time, as I mentioned earlier, to take a few minutes to think about some of the things that apply to where you are specifically people that could possibly come and talk, and how they may work at your place to have as a presenter. Is there a local brewery, winery, a bike shop? So as you're thinking of places, please go ahead and type those in the comments or into the chat box, and then in a couple minutes, I'll ask for this information to be shared out. Great. Yeah, everyone, just go ahead, uh, use your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface if you haven't yet, and start typing in your ideas. Think about your town and what's available out there. You can go ahead, Meg, if you want to continue. Or Okay. I was just going to give a minute or oh. two just to kind of let people type any, any ideas that they might have and then yeah. go ahead and share them out. There's I, a whole bunch coming I, in, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, I, unfortunately, I cannot see what people are commenting. No, that's okay. um, <laughs> nope, that's, that's what <laughs> but I would imagine. I would I imagine know. there's probably some things that are maybe some common um, things that are coming up. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So are you noticing? Yeah. Um, do you want me to start reading them off to you? I yeah, I was just going to say, do you see some recurring ideas? Um, nah, it's all over, which is good. Um, <laughs> there's uh, contact your county extension office. They always have very yes. Things. Yeah, and that's there for um, master gardeners. My mom is master gardener. Have a master garden. They had we, they had the master gardener come in and do a series on gardening. Um, a local meadery. So it makes mead as opposed to oh. wine and brew. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a retired teacher who has traveled to many places and would be happy to speak. Ooh, Spanish rodeo and cowboys. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wills and estate planning. <laughs> um, farming, another farming one. Local history. Beekeeping. Oh, there's gardening again. Um, Civil War Museum is in their town. That would be definitely Great. interesting to to. Uh, uh, partner up with a tulip farm. Um, oh, our library is on the edge of a small wine region in Oregon. So, in a town of less than four thousand, we have six wineries, one meadery, and one brewery. Wow, that I, that's a, <laughs> I will be visiting there at some point. <laughs> um, that's after, funny. I actually. I actually gave this talk at one other place, and somebody was like, "No, where is Pagosa?" Because during the talk, they found out that we have, you know, multiple places to soak in hot springs. Some of you might know that in Colorado, uh, cannabis has been legalized in this town. We now have 
well then we've got like three to five dispensaries and we have three breweries and people are like what in the world and how many people are in your town so yes yeah, kind of <laughs> you'd be surprised yeah yes. um, apple growers if you have any sort of orchards uh, beekeeping again, Mammoth Cave National Park, Historic Homes, anybody from yeah, a, a local park or something could come, Horse Farms, um, a funeral, have a funeral home come in and talk about end of life and what you would do for that, uh, quilt shop, bike shop, local musicians, uh, cheesemaker, soap, local artisan, soap maker, maple syrup, carpentry, taxidermist, ooh, um, Wow, There's amazing. some great ones yeah. in there. I'm, mm -hmm. I I am jotting down some of these to <laughs> to kind of think about for for the series because again we do it twice a year. I was somewhat disappointed that I had actually gotten in touch with a credit union. Um, that there's one in Durango, we don't have one here in Pagosa, to see about doing a wills and estate planning. Because again, as I mentioned, you know, we have an older population and I thought, oh, well, there would be lots of people that would be interested in that. And I was disappointed mm -hmm. that they said they're short staffed and just weren't able to attend. Oh. But yeah, a lot of great ideas in there. So mm -hmm. folks that are listening, thank you so mm -hmm. much again for coming. But I hope that you kind of keep thinking about things. Um, but let me go ahead and, and now that we've kind of shared out, let me mm -hmm kind of keep going Yeah, on. go ahead, continue. Yep. And, and speaking of sharing out, let's talk about how you can get the word out. As is true, workshop or event or really anything at the library, new or not new, of course it's important to get the word out. If they don't know that it's happening, then it's almost, you know, it's essentially not happening. This picture I thought was kind of cute because it shows 25 different ways to spread the word. Some may work better than others, but I thought the graphic was interesting for brainstorming on how to share this new series. And again, depending on where you are, you may have some of the, the things that I'm about to mention in terms of how we publicize it that work for you or that you have available to you. We, of course, use our usual methods of promotion through our website, our Facebook page, um, as well as on our twice a month, we have a local radio station that lets us come in and they have a little time in the librarian's corner and we go and we talk about the different events that are happening at the library and so of course we talk about that. I often, because it is a generally well anticipated series, I go ahead and give dates out once the dates have been determined. Um, I don't wait until that week to share that with them. Living in a small town, we do have a local paper that comes out once a week and so I write a special article that will be included on the paper on the week prior to its starting. In addition to the special article, we each week in the paper kind of have an ongoing where events at the library are listed and there's kind of a community calendar and so all of them are listed there as well. But I do like having that special article that people see that's in the main part of the paper. We also have two different types of handouts that people can give, well, maybe three if you include our monthly calendar. So, of course, each month, and I'm sure that most of you all do this too, we have a calendar that comes out for all of the events that are happening. We have a lot of events here at this library, so we actually have to break them down into an adult calendar, a teen calendar, and then a kids slash tween calendar. So we've got that calendar, of course, that meant the series and has it on the calendar, but I also make a pamphlet or a brochure, whichever you want to call it, that really goes into the specifics of who is speaking when and a little blurb about their talk. And so that's something that I can easily hand out to people or that people can grab when they come in for different things that are happening in here. And then I also have a kind of abbreviated one page Thing that shows at least who people, what, excuse me, <laughs> who is speaking and what they're speaking about that gives, you know, maybe a sentence or two about their talk. And that can also be used as an easy way to display in our display case or if I'm needing to make it briefer to put on our Facebook page. So again, a couple different types of handouts for people. In addition, you might also consider mentioning the series at other workshops or classes that you do. I generally teach a weekly computer class in addition to two tech times a week, so I always have those pamphlets nearby and I am sure to mention them because I, I know that I cannot always assume that people know what's going on at the library. And I'm sure that you know that, but again, it, I think that it's something good for us to kind of remind ourselves that, you know, if people don't know that something's happening at the library, in my opinion, that's our fault and not theirs. So again, just kind of thinking about how to get that word out. 
If you're fortunate to have places in town to hang a flyer, you might also consider, around, consider going around to stores or a coffee shop or maybe other meeting spots that have a community bulletin board. After years of having a twice yearly lifelong learning lecture series, people ask about the series months before it starts. I have actually already had somebody ask here. I actually think that they probably asked back in January about lifelong learning and we generally don't have lifelong learning until it will start actually in the middle of next month. So as I mentioned earlier, for us here we hold two lifelong learning lecture series per year, one in the spring and one in the fall. The spring usually goes from mid-April to mid-May, and I did just a minute ago say next month, but I'm already thinking about March, thinking that we're in March. So again, we're going from mid-April to mid-May. The fall series, I generally have it set up so that it runs for the six weeks prior to Thanksgiving. So it runs based on when Thanksgiving is, and then I just go back six weeks. We hold the series on Thursday evenings at 5.30. The library closes at 7. So again, the, the lecture or talk is about an hour or so, and it gives time for people to ask questions before they need to be out of the library by 7. That's what works for us. Again, as I said earlier, you have to kind of figure out what might work at your location. I found it helpful to ask patrons for their feedback. I've used this suggestion when starting a new book club. Instead of making it kind of wide open for when to hold them, you could decide a few times that might work for you or for your library and then kind of have a loose vote on it. The times could be based on when your library is open or when the person who would be in charge of them is available. You might even give a time when the library is closed. Many years ago, before I worked here, the Lifelong Learning Lecture Series was held on Saturdays at 3 p.m. At the time, the library closed at 3 p.m., so they kind of had this overlap, and the person who was in charge of the Lifelong Series back then would just come in and kind of stay and have it open just for the people attending the lecture. But keep in mind, as I said earlier, that there are no set rules. You can do what works for your library. Perhaps you want to just start with doing just one a year and see how it goes. Maybe you think that you might get more people in the summer. Perhaps you'd rather hold it then. Another thing to consider is what else might be going on during that time of year. You have to think about your situation. Do you live in a town with a big high school basketball team that you know does really well? And if so, then you probably want to look at what their schedule is and not, and not have a conflicting um, time that you're having your lifelong learning lecture series. That's just one example. I mean, again, there might be other things that are going on in your town, so certainly you want to consider that. Personally, I think it's really empowering to think that you get to decide so much about this series. As I mentioned earlier, we now hold our series on a different day and time than several years ago. Keep in mind that you can try something, and if that doesn't work, then you can try something else. I hope that you've learned a lot from this and feel empowered to host a lifelong learning lecture series at your library. You may have limitations or other things to consider for your specific location, but I think that you'll find that you can plan a lifelong learning lecture series at your library, again, without spending any or a lot of money, without taking too much staff time or effort. I encourage you to give it a shot. Again, I've put my email address up here. I'm going to, in just a few minutes or in just a moment, kind of open up for any questions that you might have, but I, I wanted to be sure that if you had any questions that you thought of down the line, I'm happy to answer those. And I'd also love to hear about any successes or obstacles that you have, and I wish you good luck with that. Once again, I'd like to thank you for attending this webinar, and I wish you the best of fortune. And I'm wondering if there are any questions that people might have. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes, Meg, thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, if there is anyone, there are some questions we have, but I also want to say if you have any questions, anyone who, who haven't entered, typed in yet, um, get them in there. And if you have done something like this in your town, um, yeah, definitely let Absolutely. us know about your experiences, <laughs> see who else is doing yes, this Yes, you know, we, we work in libraries. We're into recycling stuff, so of please, course. yes. <laughs> Sharing, borrowing. That's so, right. Um, be resourceful. Um, out of the, the sessions that you've done um, at your library, what um, were the most popular? What's the highest attendance you've had at these events? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the armchair, the 
the people's travels. People seem to love those. So those usually have a pretty solid attendance. I'm trying to think about other ones that have had. Um, we had Wendy Sutton, who was um, the Forest Service archaeologist. We have uh, just kind of right down the road from us, we have Chimney Rock, which a few years ago was uh, made a national monument. Mm -hmm. And so here, she here came and she talked. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What's that? Chimney Rock here in Nebraska. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, well, we also have a chimney rock, okay. <laughs> and um, and so, and it was very, very well attended because she and I'm I don't remember the exact title of her talk, but I mean, it was it's kind of very interesting to think about us living on this land now and people living on this land long ago, and she was able to kind of talk about that and different recent findings that they had at Chimney Rock. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think about other big talks um, that have gone well and that people really seem to appreciate and like. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, if I, if I had thought I would have gone back and jotted down <laughs> um, how many people had come to different talks. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so well, I'm gonna, about, okay, I'll keep thinking on that. Though. Sure, and how about from the other side? Someone wants to know, did you have any that didn't work at all? That just nobody, yeah. Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. And that is, I mean, and it probably happens to all of us. You know, you do your best to publicize it and, and promote it and, you know, talk it up and get people. We did actually have somebody come from Durango, and I thought the talk was interesting. Um, he was actually talking about women in Islam. Oh, and I, I don't know if the, the, and it's of course always hard to figure out what the issue is. For him that he was presenting, of course on a Thursday, but it was October the 30th, so I don't know if there was maybe Halloween stuff happening. Um, I don't know if there were sports in town. You know, again, it's it's hard um, to kind of know, and I, and I I always feel bad when it's somebody else that's doing a talk or a workshop or something that we're doing, and then the turnout is low. Mm -hmm. And and I don't really know that I have great solutions for that because hopefully you've done everything you can. I mean, when when there weren't many people, I think he maybe had two people come to his talk, and I again, you know, I I did what I. I publicized his the same way I publicized the person who was the week prior, which had 22 people, which mm. I consider to be a large number for this small town that we live in. So I, I said Archuleta County is 12,000 people, but in this town, it's 1,500 people. Mm. And so the 22, I'm, I'm pretty happy with. Um, you know, I, I don't really have other great suggestions. I did you know, kind of walk around the library prior five or ten minutes before it's starting saying, hey, you know, we're having this great talk, and, and I think that's how I got one other person in there, but yeah, of course there are going to be talks that just don't work out, and mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't, I haven't noticed a, like a theme of, oh, these talks don't work, or, you know, whatever. Again, I've avoided a lot of the, I mentioned Fort Lewis College, and pulling talks, or at least looking at their talks and seeing if any might work over here. Um, yeah, Some of them talks just look fairly academic, and so we don't. Sure, they would. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Someone else commented that they are. I am very reluctant to schedule speakers because our program attendance is very low. It's sort of a chicken and egg problem, and yes. that may be part of your marketing. Some like, where are you? Where are you promoting this? Uh, I don't know. Where are you asking me that question, or just yeah, well, or just a way to help them? You figure out you know, how can they get people to come to their programs more. Well, um, so again, think about what kind of media you have access to in your town. If you have a library page with like a slideshow that talks about different events that are happening, the library, of course, broadcast it up there. Put signs up around the library. I know that people don't always read signs. Um, but if you put something that is kind of right in their face, maybe, in fact, one thing that I actually, when I first heard it, I thought, well, that's a little crass, but I know that it has been very helpful, is putting the information on the back of the, the bathroom stall. Um, so then when people close the door, 
they're seeing this information. So again, just kind of thinking about where you can put just signs up in your library. We've got a couple different places in town. We've got like an Ace Hardware. We've got a couple uh, coffee shops where we can post things about what's going on. I mentioned the radio. Um, our Facebook page, if you use Twitter or of course anything like that in your library, put it up there. I would be sure to mention it to um, or within other events or workshops that you're having at your library, not things that are necessarily even connected to it. I mean, you know, maybe it's story time. Mention it there. And you, never, yeah, you never know what's gonna, what interests are going to cross over. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, that's exactly right. You don't, you don't ever know. Um, I generally, when there's a program I'm really trying to push, I usually put flyers or, in this case, brochures in my car. So, oh, I'm going out to eat and I think, oh, well, I've seen other, th you know, and I can just quickly run out to the car and ask if they'll put it up with their other things. So, again, having that information ready and ready to just kind of hand out instead of thinking, oh, well, I could go here and go here at the time, mm -hmm. having it and being able to run out there. Um, I mentioned the radio here. The newspapers has been great to us over the years in terms of kind of letting us or at least having like the community calendar that they include us in. Yeah, but I, I certainly ask, understand. Ask a couple of questions about that actually, about your newspaper. How did you get that set okay. up and does it cost anything to have things in there in the paper or on the community calendar? It actually doesn't in our town. Oh. Um, we, we have a couple different things. So when we send the special articles. I mean, the only parameter really that we've been given is that it has to be under 500 words, which mm -hmm. generally this is, you know, just I, I'm able to talk about the dates and when it's going to be held and who's coming in their talk and maybe a sentence or two and include it all in there for under 500 words. They do not charge us for special articles and I've used that with other events that we're having here as well. The community calendar we are not the only organization that's set up in there, and no, we don't we don't pay for that. We did at one point, um, but we canceled that just kind of for budgetary reasons and kind of tightening it down. We used to do a weekly. It was called Did You Know, and it was just a, essentially an ad in the paper, and we could use that. I mean, we used it for a wide variety of stuff, but we could say like, Oh, you, did you know? And then something about the library. Mm -hmm. But we've canceled that, so we really try and limit the. I mean, we just don't have a huge budget to be spending on so we pull from what we can but I mean I can certainly relate to the person that was saying they're hesitant to get speakers um, because they aren't sure of their turnout one thing that you might also consider I know that um, that worked well is that we had it was actually one of our staff she no longer works here because she retired but she came and she talked and she's pretty well known in the community so she was talking about it at at her church and her friends and so she had a lot of people that came to hear her talk ah, and so right. they can promote themselves. I mean, that's when, absolutely right <laughs> right you know I mean if it's something that they put on their Facebook page or you know on like their personal Facebook page or you know or they send out maybe a blast email that's like hey you know I'm doing this thing come and support me and mm -hmm. I mean and I know that it's not really the speaker's job to do that but it certainly is a way that you know, to think about getting additional people in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we have a lot of tips from other people um, about how they've done it. Um, someone says they put the info on a screensaver on their computers. Um, and depending on the group that's targeted, they send out flyers to the local schools so the students can learn about it or they can then bring the flyers home to their parents. Um, and a couple of comments about the bathroom stall thing. They've seen it work really well in a department store announcing their job fairs and another other library sure. does it and actually had a specifically branded it, the bathroom stall, and called it the Stall Street Journal. <laughs> the guy was nice. like, yeah, that, nice. that's funny. <laughs> and then someone is really ambitious, but it's, 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 they say, in my small town of under 600, we have a friend, a member of the Friends Group, who actually calls the phone book, as they call it, which is their phone list, to remind people of programs. So wow. just call, yeah, I mean, you're a small town. If you've got someone who's volunteer to do that, sure. <laughs> I mean, I will say but, that, so I, I teach a weekly computer class, and that's something that people sign up for, and so I get their email or phone number, and I call to remind them, and people often appreciate it. I mean, it it probably wouldn't be that hard to, you know, finagle me or a volunteer that if somebody wanted to kind of be reminded about it, then sure, we'll give you a call. Or if people do email, or if you have kind of an email distribution set up, you know, mm -hmm, just absolutely. because people yeah. need reminders, we have a lot going on. 
you know, yeah. in our life. Online in, newsletters, what, yeah, whatever you use, use it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so some other people have some ideas that um, you, we'd ask for input on what other people have done. So here's some other places that have done something similar. Um, someone said they had a very success, successful end of the garden se gardening season series covering winter gardening, putting garden, gardens to bed, planting bulbs, which will come up next spring, sharpening and winterizing tools. Um, we did it in late fall, which isn't gardening season, but it's you're prepping for that. So that, and I said that was very well attended. Um, Someone else said they they're one of their most popular ones. Our largest attendance ever was on solar and wind power. Yes, that was a we did a topic. we yeah we did a solarize archuleta here recently mm -hmm. in the last fall. Mm -hmm. And someone and, has and a uh, fair of people came. <laughs> I'm someone sorry, has go ahead. <laughs> partnered with the Extension Service for a Lunch and Learn se series. So over the noon hour, um, we supply a late lunch and the Extension Service does the program. So financial plan planning, eating smart, whatever they want to. Um, someone else has to be very good, and this is good too, going, um, not necessarily having people come to the library, but going out. So this would really be good to do at a senior center during their lunch hour. Everyone is there, they're being fed, and then you kind of a captive audience. <laughs> sure. Um, Someone had a very successful talk with a mushroom expert for about foraging for mushrooms. Um, ooh, someone, oh, oh, here we go. Up in um, northeast Nebraska at our South Sioux City Public Library, their largest event was a Sioux Medicine Man from Pine Ridge. They had 180 people that showed up for that. Wow. That is awesome, yeah. What? That I I think I would fall over if we had one. <laughs> I don't know where I would put them. I don't even know if our whole library could hold 180. I, I don't know. But, you'd have to find a place to hold it. And hopefully you'd be prepared sure. to know that that was going to be happening. Right. Right. <laughs> um, oh, someone did a 3D printer demonstration for retired engineers. That's the thing, too. You could focus on a certain group and say, we'll do a thing for you. And it's related. Mm -hmm. you know, the library then gets, like you said, connected um, to them. Uh, okay, now we have some questions. Um, oh, the stall thing. It was the Stall Street Journal. So, like, Wall Street Journal. That's the one that somebody yeah. commented. <laughs> I, I had to, I jotted that down. I like that. Stall yeah. Street Journal. Um, someone wants to know, oh, you're, you're, when you have to travel people, and someone wants to know, do you call it armchair travels? That would be a nice, uh, tagline for those kind of I... talks. Um, well, one thing that I didn't really go into is I do have, and just to kind of keep everything clear and make sure I have everything, is that when a speaker agrees to um, giving a presentation, I have a kind of, um, it's somewhat generic form that I send to them that does a few different things. It asks for their contact information so that I am sure to get their mailing address because, of course, we want to send thank you follow-up cards, of course, to people. It also asks for a short biography about them, which is what I usually use when I'm introducing them. In addition, it asks about like AV requirements and, and that type of thing, but it also asks for the title of their talk. And usually people offer the title, but I, I often use the armchair travels or armchair tourists because that's something that I feel that people kind of are familiar with or at mm -hmm. least kind of understand the concept. It's fairly... Yeah. Easy to understand if, you, if you've never heard it. Yeah, it's good to let them, you know, um, brand their own session if they want to. This is what I want to set, be the topic or the title of my of my right. event that I'm doing, yeah. And then in addition, I usually ask them to provide, you know, two to three or five sentences, depending on how long the sentences are, a description that is what I use to put in the brochure that I then, you know, maybe have to edit down to put in that one page flyer that I was talking about. But yeah, I, I think that people often appreciate kind of having that level of involvement. It, when there have been other people that have been interested but, you know, aren't necessarily sure what to call it or aren't necessarily sure how to present it, I'm more than happy to, you know, kind of give some input or help them with that because if they yeah. have the knowledge, I'm going to do what I can to, you know, get them feeling more comfortable to present it. Absolutely, yeah, I do the same thing here. Like they may, have, they're happy talking about their 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 topic, but they're they're not they're not a marketer. They don't know what's the best way for me right. to market this and phrase it. But from experience, you know, well, other people have said this, this, and this. So how about how does this sound? 
Um, right. And someone asks, um, that form that you send them, could you make that available? Like a, a Absolutely. Of that? Yeah. Absolutely. If you send that to me, I can post it up when we post up the slides. Okay. So that if you, people want to borrow that as a way of reaching out to some of these um, potential speakers. And and one other thing is we're kind of talking about publicizing and and you know I did kind of promise that part of it is kind of doing it with a low amount of effort. I mean some of this certainly you I mean it takes work to write a special article, but again I keep it and can generally cut and paste. I mean I have to put in that specific you know this series that's coming up in the spring, but a lot of times I just kind of change it up a little bit. But the brochure, what mm -hmm. I can tell you is that the brochure from spring to fall to spring to fall, you know, I mean, it looks the same. All I do is I cut and paste from the form. Um, and some people might think that that sounds kind of lazy to not like change the colors or whatever. But in my opinion, mm -hmm. I think that one, it saves time. But two, I think that people get used to kind of the form or the brochure looking a certain way. And that's what they're looking for when they come in wanting to know about the lifelong learning. It's recognized. Changing it. Yeah, you're recognizing right. it. That's exactly branding, right. That's exactly right. You know, your your newspaper, your your Wall Street Journal. You can glance, you know, and from another corner of your eye, you can tell the difference between your local paper, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. You know, because they all are always formatted and colored and look the same. Yeah. Right. Right, and in addition, like I said, it also saves you from having to kind of recreate or, you know, and again, kind of cutting down on effort. Yeah, and also this is something I do here when I suggest for people doing marketing. If you have multiple places that you're doing this in, like you'd mentioned, um, your Facebook page, new online newsletter, website, um, paper, uh, you only write the article or the promotion once, and then you can just paste it into all these separate places. You know, it can be overwhelming yes. to say I have to market it in like four different places. Well, no, you've got to write it once, and then just <laughs> paste, 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 paste. Paste it in time. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's all you have to do. It's not nearly as in, as terrifying as it could be. <laughs> That's exactly right. And and yeah. as with many other things, you just kind of get faster and at doing it. So, I mean, sure, maybe right. it'll take you longer the first time you do it, but, you know, after you've done a few of them or, you know, a couple of years of them or however long it takes us to kind of adapt, yeah, things just get faster. And it, just, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, someone else, one more person had an idea of a way to um, promote the event and, and specifically in this case using Twitter, but offer a free book to the first few, few people who attend, sort of like a door prize type thing. And that they oh, that like could that. be something, yeah, promotional. And then with, for the next one, you could say, you know, these people won last time. Here's, you know, don't you could win the next time. If you have like book sale books or something, just a few that might be right. able to sure. let go as just a freebie. Absolutely. Well, and it um, might help people to come earlier. Sometimes we and true. Sometimes we, sometimes we have people that come in late and. And I often leave it up to the speaker. So in theory, the talk starts at 5.30. But if, if uh, they don't like the idea that they're going to be kind of interrupted, they're certainly welcome to wait a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Usually they just go ahead and start on time. But people come late. So, yeah, that's a good, I mm -hmm. that's a good idea for a few reasons. Sense, but especially to get people, yeah. you know, in their seats by five. Yeah, exactly. The first five people in get this paperback, whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and we have a little, just we'll do this final one since we're about up with your time here. Um, do you ever do talks on current events or things that might spark debates? For example, political issues, climate change, so things, Supreme Court cases that might impact daily life. Something that might, you know, create more of not just a presentation but a actual really back and forth interactive type thing. Yes, we have had a few of those. Um and and I think that they've gone relatively well. We have a coming this spring we have Judith Reynolds who is um she's kind of a political cartoonist and she mm -hmm. is the one person who's coming from Durango and it was part of the lifelong learning lecture series at Fort Lewis, and she's going to be talking about kind of when satire becomes sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. um, and and I do wonder, you know, with this being, you know, a political year, I mean, every year's a political year, but since this is a voting year, I, I'm considering it really a political year, mm -hmm. you know, I do wonder kind of what level that will bring people. Mm -hmm. And then we also had um, last fall, I think it was, we had a gentleman 
come and he was speaking he had done a lot of traveling to other places and you wouldn't really necessarily think that, that would kind of spark a big discussion in terms of kind of culture and how people are viewed but it really did and I remember mm -hmm. thinking okay all right you know and just kind of wondering is this going to become a heated debate that's going to be a problem or just kind of a heated debate that people will be interacting with right um, an interesting discussion I, right I, I don't necessarily I mean I would say try it. I mean, you know, if, if you find that you have higher attendance at those, then keep on scheduling them. Um, yeah, I, I haven't done a ton of those, but I have certainly had some that I'm like, okay, we're having a good discussion here. You know, people are asking questions or people are making a lot of comments, really, you know, kind of, and there's a lot of back and forth, and that's, it's, you know, it's, and, and it's good and it can be, you know, good or bad, they're engaged. And that right. is what That's makes the right. difference sometimes, yeah. And there was, and there was one that, um, that same one that I was talking about, the guy that had kind of traveled around and was kind of talking about that. It sparked. I mean, there were so many people interested in what he was saying that the library closed at seven. But because I'm here, and I was like, well, uh, okay, you know, let me see if I can get a coworker who's willing to stay after. And <laughs> we just kept like the library closed, and they turned off all the lights and all the computers except for the room that we were in. And you know, people stayed and. If you want to stay, stay. And I was like, okay, and yeah, talking will 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 facilitate that. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, and I, I don't usually do that because, again, what that requires is that I get an additional coworker to say that they're willing to stay. But I'm fortunate that on that Thursday night, there's somebody that it doesn't take much to say, hey, can you hang around for a little bit? And yeah, totally, no problem. And yeah. so it's nice. That's cool. And if, because again, you have community engagement, then keep them engaged. <laughs> you know, don't yeah, keep them happy. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, that was the last question we had up here, so I think that will be good to perfect place to wrap up for your session. Thank you so much, Meg. That was very useful um, and lots of cool ideas that I want to see some libraries around here doing. I would attend so many of those things. <laughs> so many of I know, those. Topics. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody, for. for for you know for attending but also like I said I was jotting notes because you know we're into sharing so yeah and I, w I would love to hear from some of you so I hope that some of you did take up the offer to jot down my email I'd love to hear about how things go there yeah sure absolutely great thank you so much Meg 